for us you heal the leper cleanse our bodies and souls from every sin in thought and in deed and sanctify our spirits with your Holy Spirit may we glorify you with purity and holiness and give thanks to you to your father to your Father and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the eternal Word who took flesh and became like us in all things but sin, to the Creator of all who appeared to the world as physician, and He of the sick in body and in soul. To the good one be glory and honor on this blessed Sunday and all the days of our lives and forever. O Christ, our God, physician of souls and of bodies, in your plan of salvation you had pity on the leper, who was an outcast, and you healed him by your word. We lift up our eyes and our hearts to you at all times, and we implore you never to keep your mercy and grace from us but to look upon us with compassion as you did with the leper. Cleanse us and make us holy. Now, O Lord, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to stretch forth your hand and to have compassion upon us. For you have said, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door shall be opened to you. With unfailing hope, and we implore you to forgive our sins in your love, and to heal us in your grace. Accept those who repent and bring back those who have gone astray. Console the grieving and strengthen the weak. Satisfy the hungry and provide for those in need. Bless those who are generous and enrich them with good deeds. 
Remember the departed who have gone to their rest hoping in you. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Heavenly physician, after you healed the leper, you told him to go and to show himself to the priest and make an offering. Now with the fragrance of this incense, we offer ourselves to you as an offering pleasing to you. In your mercy, accept it from us and protect us. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Christ our Lord, our physician, you have made the leper clean. Now we beg you to heal us. By your word, forgive our sins. Lord our God, you have it for the just and offered you. Now accept in your mercy of your sacrifice and praise. 
reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and her children forever. Brothers and sisters, therefore, sin must not reign over your mortal bodies so that you may obey their desires. And do not present the parts of your bodies to sin as weapons for wickedness, but present yourselves to God as raised from the dead to life, and the parts of your bodies to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin is not to have any power over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Of course not. Do, not, do you not know that if you present yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that although you were once slaves of sin, you have become obedient from the heart to the pattern of teaching to which you were entrusted. Freed from sin, you have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your nature. For just as you presented the parts of your bodies as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness for lawlessness, so now present them as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free from righteousness. But what profit did you get then from the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now that you have been freed from sin, and have become slaves of God, the benefit that you have leads to sanctification, and it ends, and it, it ends, is it, its end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise be to God always. For the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. <clears throat> From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Mark, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. The evangelist Mark writes, And rising very early before dawn, Jesus left, and he went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him came after him, and on finding him, they said, Everyone is looking for you. He told them, Let us go on to the nearby villages, that I may preach there also. For this purpose have I come. So he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole of Galilee. And a leper came up to him, 
and kneeling down before him, begged him and said, If you wish, you can make me clean. I moved with pity. He stretched out his hand, he touched him, and he said to him, I do will it be made clean. And the leprosy left him immediately, and he was cleansed. Then, warning him sternly, he dismissed him at once. This is the truth, peace be with you. Do you not know that to what you yield yourselves as servants to obey, its servants you are which you obey? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So, of course, the great fast is a season for us to ask the question to ourselves, what do we actually serve in this life? What do we give our energies for? What do we make our sacrifices for? Sacrifice in the sense of things that cost us. And that really is part of our examination of conscience. So when we look at this letter of St. Paul, so chapter 6, he's going to deal with baptism. He's going to deal with the transformation of a person's very existence through our Lord and in our Lord. But one of the things he writes to the Romans here, and if you read the first part of the chapter, he talks about all the decadence of the classical pagan world. Not all of their decadence, but he touches on a number of the major ones. And what he reminds the people in Rome is that you yourselves served this paganism. You served things, you did things, you sacrificed, you saved money, you made efforts to do certain things in your life which you are now ashamed of. And what St. Paul is reminding us is that it's not just simply the fact that sin is committed, which again is a mistake, the word just means mistake. The sin is committed, but the main problem actually is not about the actions it's about the individual choosing to do these things. Sin runs very deep. The mistake, the wounds that are in our lives, they run very deeply. And so when St. Paul is reminding them, he's saying the things that you made the effort for, the things that you listened to, that you obeyed, those Friday nights, those weeks on the town, whatever it may be, the vacation you have to go on, all of these different things that we have done in our lives, he says, and he's echoing our Lord from the gospel. And the word here, obey, means primarily its fundamental aspect. The word originally means to hear, to listen to. And he says, the things that you have listened to intently, habitually, those are the things that you are slaves to. Those things make you serve them. And again, he's echoing our Lord. So he uses this whole image of, of the members of your body, the feet which carried you to those places that you shouldn't have been in, the eyes that wandered over the screens and the places that you shouldn't have been intent on looking on. It's why in the classical form of the extreme unction, that before a person dies in grave danger of death, all the senses are anointed, everything including historically your feet, because they carried us places that we shouldn't have gone. And so St. Paul is reminding us he's, that there is one individual who acts and who operates, which is why he says, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies. So the lives that you have now, your physical life, don't allow the mistake the bad choices, 
to be sovereign, to give the governance and the direction in order, he says, to make you obey the passions of the body. Passions are just our emotions. They're the emotions, it's our feelings, our sentiments. It is our feelings of hurt. It's our desire of recognition. It can be our lust. All of these different emotions that run through us, they're just meant to be subordinated to the individual, not the individual following the sins. It's why what we're doing during the great fast is when we, when we have this introspection and we see the aspect of the cleansing of the leper today as the gospel, it's placed here for the obvious reasons of being cleansed. This is what we look for to be healed by our Lord. And of course, leprosy is a very strange thing. I mean, it's a bacterial infection that we know now, but it's something which, of course, totally flipped everybody out because it was such, such grotesque and lingering, long-lasting effects but in the skin. But we know that it's much deeper than that. It affects the nerves. It affects eyesight. They would lose their sight. They can be treated now with antibodies. For the moment that antibodies are still effective. We'll see what happens in the next century. But for the, so for us, even knowing leprosy, not just simply as a skin disease, which is the way the classical world saw it. And so the fathers always interpreted it as a symbol of sin. But even knowing its biological makeup now, it even has a better imagery of sin. Because it's not just simply on the surface, it's not just simply on the skin. It affects the nerves, it affects the eyes. It has this deep depth of invisibility to us of this bacterial infection, which is even a better example of sin. That sin is not just something that happens. It's not just simply an action or something that I should have done that I didn't do. So I've mentioned to you numerous times before, when we go to confession, it is not to go in with a laundry list and then just simply tick off each thing. That just means we know our catechism and I know that doing that was wrong. But the sacrament of penance of the precious blood, of this healing is much deeper than that. It is also bringing us a greater self-knowledge to know more deeply, not just simply what I've done wrong, but ultimately why. And so what comes in the sacrament of penance is not just simply forgiveness of sins, that's obviously what takes place, but it is a divine mystery. It brings grace and the touch of God to our lives, which is something positive. It's because God touches by grace in the divine sacraments the grace being given, because of that, our sins are healed. It's not a negative thing. It's a positive thing of giving the life of God to the individual. But it also brings the light of that grace and of self-knowledge. For example, I may go into the confession and I may say that I lied, rather common in human life. And I lied three times. Okay. Okay. That's fine. And I go out, and then I'm always mystified as to why I lie again, usually in the same circumstances, and often to the same people that I lied to before. Because the same causes have the same effects. So what the sacrament of penance also gives is the grace of self-knowledge. And ultimately what we're doing in the great Lent, when we say to our Lord, like the leper, if you desire this, you can make me clean, is we are asking for the grace of self-knowledge and ultimately the knowledge to see ourselves as God sees us. So when we do the examination of conscience, which should, should be part of our daily life, that we look over our day at the end of the day, our thoughts, our words, our actions, and the things that we should have done, our omissions that we didn't do, and of course, when we do it as a regular practice, it's only a question of a couple minutes because we know what we're looking for. Because I know I'm in a scoundrel in this part and maybe that part. I know what I'm looking for. But for example, going back to that exa this recognition of a lie 
is I can lie for a num numerous reasons, but two of the big ones are I lie, one, to escape responsibility. I try to get out of something that I have done or didn't do that I was supposed to do. But I can also lie because I just tell big stories. I inflate things. I make things look different than they do otherwise. But of course, you go deeper behind that. I may be lying to get out of responsibility. So why am I trying to escape responsibility? That takes me deeper into that permeation of what we call original sin, that wound within us. So that yes, I may lie because I'm escaping a responsibility at work or at school, at home, whatever it might be. But the question becomes then I ask myself is why do I try to escape responsibility? Am I just lazy so I don't do the things I'm supposed to be doing? So now you've gone deeper into why that lie came out of my mouth. Because ultimately, I can recognize that in my self-knowledge that I actually, on many things, at least in this specific instance, was lazy and negligent. So now the, what I confess of a lie is true. But what is more important to understand the chain behind it that leads me back to a truer self-knowledge of why that lie came out. And only when I come to the knowledge that in fact, from the lie to escape responsibility, that perhaps I'm lazy, that's where I have to work, at that level of knowing what I'm doing. But that lie can also be that I inflate stories. I like to gossip, I tell stories, I like to look different than I am. And that, of course, is indicating that the lie is out of vanity. My life by appearances, the way I look, it is a predominant fact of the modern world where everything is lived by appearances. My Facebook, my edited, my edited videos on Facebook, this type of a thing. So you have, you have two individuals here who have confessed exactly the same thing, but for profoundly different reasons. This is why when we talk about the great fast or examination of conscience, we are looking for a healing, which is not about an action that I should have done or didn't do or did do and shouldn't have done. It's not about that so much. I mean, those things we have to recognize, that's the beginning. But it's so much deeper for us to go to this realization of what truly is the leprosy in my life. And that's what the Great Lent is really about why we tithe these six weeks to God out of the 52. It is our 10%, if you want, more or less, that we return to God of seriousness of the way that we pursue these weeks. And one of the things is that examination of conscience. That is our leprosy. I wanted it to bring, because I just want to give you a consideration liturgically. Most of you have noticed, probably, that the Maronite liturgy doesn't have any form of a confitior. There's no, I confess to you, my brother. There's no confession that is made, verbally. The confession that is made in the act of conversion is the husoyo, and we'll talk more about that next week. But the husoyo is the incense ceremony. And we'll talk about it more in detail, but I just want to leave you with the notion of incense. The notion of incense in the East, and especially in the Syriac tradition, is much, 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 much different than the notion of incense in the Western church. In the Western church, it's honorific. You incense all kinds of stuff because it smells pretty, it's nice, and you know, it's a little more elaborate. It has a sense of, of rendering honor. <clears throat> Which is why in the Western church, you'll have thurifers, you'll have young men, you'll have men, you'll have men who will be carrying the censer and who will do incensations. You will never see that in the Syriac tradition. The incense is exclusively a function of priesthood as it was in the Old Testament. In the old law, if you tried to duplicate the recipe, if you want, for incense that's in the old law. That was considered, and you use it at home because it smells pretty. That was considered in the old law a capital crime, and you would die for it. 
because the incense has a totally different aspect within the law of Moses that the Syrian church being kind of in a sense, well not kind of in a sense, certainly as a descendant of that Jewish Christianity, the incense has a very specific notion behind it. And it is not just honorific. And the incense ceremony is central to everything we do liturgically. So that when Saint Ephraim is writing in the 300s, his poetry, for him he says that the incense is a sign of atonement it is a covering for sin. Now the same way that on one hand we can talk about the fact that I can go from my lie to my vanity and then deeper into this aspect of why I do certain things because this aspect will permeate my life in so many ways that is only instrumentalized, as St. Paul says, through my members, how I walk, how I speak, where I go to, what I look at, what I desire to listen to. They're just instruments of something that's much deeper within the core. St. Ephraim will talk about this as being a covering for sin the same way in the aspect that incense will permeate all around. So the poor people in this parish for the last almost four years now, they've been subjected to more incense apparently than they used to. I like it. But on one, so, and I also use that the Orthodox make, because it really is heavy. This stuff is lighter. It'll be lighter for these next days. We'll go back to more of the heavier stuff at Easter, because it's more perfumey, more flowery, nice for spring, and nice for the big major feast. But of course, incense goes everywhere. You wind up having it. And so one of the poor individuals who didn't like all the perfume, we had moments in the beginning where I'd be putting incense in here and someone would start choking at the back of the church when nothing actually had burned yet because of the apprehension of what's coming. But it is precisely that symbolism that that perfume exudes and penetrates all around. When you walk into this building when nothing is going on, it still smells. It's in the carpet, it's in the woods, it's in the plaster. And that's why St. Ephraim says that the incense is, is precisely a, a symbol of that covering of sin and the sign of atonement. And in the writings through the 400s, through the 5th century, through the 8th century, it is referred to as being a sin offering. If you remember in the old law, the incense was offered as its own proper act of sacrifice morning and night, every single day in the temple. In fact, it's where Zechariah was when the angel Gabriel came to him to announce the birth of the child John. And so this sin offering, this sign of atonement, this covering of sin, incense also has the symbolism of the presence of the word, the divine word, so that we have prayers, oftentimes you see them in the older translations for different feast days of the saints. It'll refer to our Lord as being the fragrance that radiates from the center of creation, the word, the divine word. So that the act of creation, of giving things existence and of life, takes on the symbolism also of incense. It is the perfume and existence that radiates outward. That of our Lord himself, who is the fragrance of the heart of creation. And a third aspect of the incense is that it symbolizes the sacrifice of Christ, who is consumed on Calvary. We have, for example, in the Mass for the Confessors, in which we ask that as this incense is consumed, that we ourselves be consumed and serve for your purpose. This notion then of our Lord's sacrifice, that he offers himself as a fragrant sacrifice. So a number of you used to, would go to, the, you go to the old Latin mass. You see it in the prayers. You offer the chalice itself. And the chalice is referred to as being a great, a beautiful fragrance before God. That's just echoing the old law. So the sacrifice that takes place cosmically, which is the center of all existence, is our Lord's death on Calvary. So the incense also is the representation of our Lord's death on Calvary. St. Paul in the letter to the Ephesians speaks about our Lord as offering himself as a fragrant sacrifice. 
And the last thing that the incense represents and is within the Syriac tradition is it purifies one's own sacrifice. It purifies, and this is our patriarch at the beginning of the 18th century, uh, beginning of the 17th century, Dawahi. This process is up actually for canonization. But Dawahi, when he talks about the incense, is he says that this is the purification and the purity, if you want, of one's giving, one's sacrifice. And that is an echo from St. Paul saying that we are meant to be the fragrance of Christ, the good aroma of Christ. And so it purifies in imitating Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. So we leave you just with that idea today, this permeation, that as we look in the examination of conscience to go more deeply into where are our efforts placed in our life? Where do we actually labor as we examine our lives? That the incense itself will be this incense ceremony which will be the conversion. So you have there already the understanding of what, what incense itself represents. So that St. Paul, we can finish with, what St. Paul says is that when you are aware of these things and the permeation and the depth of what God has freed you from, and freed us from in our leprosy. He says that having been freed from sin, we have now become slaves of justice. If what we've served in our lives have been all those shortcomings, those sins, that lust, that ambition, that lying, whatever it may be, he says when you've been healed and freed from that, it's not just so that you're landing in an empty hole. You are freed from that so that now what you serve and what your efforts and your labors go to and what you hear, what you obey, is now being slaves of sin. So may our lives become this service of sin, excuse me, this service of justice and this transformation of righteousness so that we go from having this incompletion of mistake and woundedness to the transformation of the fullness of the integrity of being healed, so that the words of our prayer during Lent truly are real towards our Lord, towards the Sacred Heart of saying, if you desire this, you can make me whole. You can heal me. And I'm never to forget that the graces that are given to us during the liturgical seasons vary throughout the year. We are receiving graces now in Lent that are not being given to us in August. And so avail ourselves with wisdom day after day in our prayers that God may touch us and say to us, this I desire, be healed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
Tell what Madame Heda Loho, Walwata Loho, and Paleta Yot. I never so go time to talk, hey, old Albite of Westwood and Hayek Law, or go on a show. Lord and God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, the Chosen One, Saints Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Eustathius. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for all the members of this parish. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
continue with the anaphora of St. Peter, chief of the apostles, on page 774. 774. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Father, God of peace and Lord of security, make us worthy to embrace one another with a sincere kiss in the spirit of your unending love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your only Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. blessings and assistance for we are weak and you are the support and refuge of all we raise glory to you to your only son and to your holy spirit now and forever O oh lord may the light of your face shine upon us deliver us from every evil and blot out our transgressions that we may raise glory and thanks to you to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> the love of God the Father, and the grace of the only begotten Son, and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your Spirit, let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and just. Truly, it is right and just to glorify and exalt you, O Maker of all creation. With the angels, we glorify you, and with voices of praise. We cry out and we proclaim. You sent your Son into the world, and he became flesh of the Virgin Mary for our salvation. Amen. 
ubarahu kodesh waksunya bel tarmida karamara sabakhul mene kulhu khunu denita fakhru diyala dahlu faykun wahlaf sagiyen ete sharu meti hab Khusun khame wa khayil al-qalam al-ameen Khawqanna al-kursu dumzikhu min khamra wa min mayu Barakhu qadish Ya bil talmida karamara Sabish tawa mehne kul khun Khunu dani tawa Dhu dila diya tiki khada to Dakhlu faikun wakhlaf sagiyen Mete sharu meti hab Khusun khame wa khayin al qalam alameen He then commanded and instructed them, saying, Each time you celebrate these holy mysteries, you remember my death and resurrection until I come again. Remember your coming that saved us, and as we await your second coming, we offer you praise and ask you, on the day when you will judge the righteous and sinners, do not condemn us because of our sins, but have compassion and mercy upon us. Turn your holy face away from our sins and assist us. For this your church implores you, and through you and with you, Employs your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father. Have mercy on us. O oh Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we confess our faith in you, and we ask you. May those who share in these holy mysteries be cleansed, body and soul, from every sin and receive eternal life. Amen. O Lord, accept our intercessions and our prayers and grant security to your people and peace to your flock. Protect our shepherds, Francis the Pope of Rome, the Shara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, and Gregory John, our Bishop. Assist the priests, the deacons, and all those who serve your Holy Church, so that they may intercede and pray to you on our behalf. We pray to you, O Lord. 
Remember, O Lord, those who have asked us to pray for them, those who desired but were unable to make an offering, and those who assist your holy church. Be a shelter and refuge for them, for you are the Savior of all. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the civil leaders in our country and throughout the world. Enlighten their consciences to bring security and peace to your people. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the Holy Virgin Mary, Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, St. Marin, St. Jude, St. Charbel, St. Eusephus, and all the saints, Assist us through their prayers and make us worthy of their reward. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the righteous fathers and teachers who have gone to their rest among the saints. Remember those who diligently carried your gospel throughout the whole world and who confirmed your holy church in the true faith. Assist us through their prayers and strengthen us in your love. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Favor, remember, O Lord, our parents, brothers, sisters, teachers, and all the faithful departed here and everywhere who have gone to their rest. Forgive us and forgive them of all sins and offenses. Through our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. And the rest of God to the departed, and forgive us sins we have committed, with or without full knowledge. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. As it was, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you, to you, you Lord of O God the Father, you strengthen and encourage us, for we are weak. We implore you to purify us from every sin and to accept our offering so that in one spirit we may call upon you praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thy will be done. O 
Lord, lead us not into the trials of temptation that we do not have the strength to overcome, but deliver us from every evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And O Lord, bless your worshipers who bow before you and implore you. Make them worthy of your mercy and forgive all their sins, for you are almighty and rich in compassion. We raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And with your spirit. Holy gifts for the holy, with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one Holy, Holy Father, Father, one, one Holy, Holy Son, one, one Holy Spirit. Bless us be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your very blood, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, you be glory.
again and again we thank you, O Lord, and raise glory to you, for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. A lover of all people, have mercy. We thank you, O Father, for this gift that you have given us, though we are unworthy. Do not shame us because of our sins, but help and save us, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. 
Peace be with you. Lord Jesus, stretch forth your right hand and bless your people. Protect them by your cross, be their shelter and refuge, and perfect them with your abundant blessings, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your blessed Father, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. So it's just to mention that we have the Lenten copy of the Maronite Voice that came this week, so you're more than encouraged to pick up a copy as you go out the door. And as always, it is lovely to see you. You know you're approaching your one-year anniversary of this, right? Hopefully you're absorbing Antioch and Syriac. It is lovely to have you. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever.